because the radical constructivists say that each individual is a closed system, mm -hmm. only in touch with its own processes. Right. And um, they're not, people think that the radical constructivists are saying there's no reality. And I don't think that's what they're saying. I think they're saying that if there is one, we can never be in direct contact with it. All we can ever know is the ways in which um, it triggers various things within us. We know our responses, right? Um, but we never really get outside of the closed system that we are to that world. Mm -hmm. um, so this, in some ways, seems different because each world, then, for each person, is a private world. Right. Um, now that doesn't mean that people don't have similar experiences because there are certain structural similarities between us. We're human beings, mm -hmm. right? Which is why, you know, when I look at something and my cat looks at something, it may look really different. In good measure, our structures are different. Mm -hmm. Kind of systems that we are are different. Right. But in some ways, that seems like there's some tension there between that kind of radical constructivist view and phenomenal yeah, phenomenology. Uh, absolutely, and I think that's a key difference between the two, mm -hmm. is that this notion of a private, even the whole notion of private space, interior space, right. is something that I think you see consistently questioned in a radical way. Well, by in some ways, the, the radical constructivists say. All you know is that internal experience. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not something there. It's that we can't rationally prove it. And, mm -hmm. and this is one of the things I've been interested in lately, which is this distinction between what we can rationally know mm -hmm. and what we affectively believe. Mm -hmm. So people believe, I mean, when I'm, you know, I, so I might call myself a constructivist, but when I go out bowling, I don't pick up the bowling ball and say, you know, is there a bowling ball here? <laughs> you know? And, and I, I, I treat it like a bowling ball. <laughs> right. Um, and the way I've been taught to treat it like a bowling ball and based on my past experiences. And so emotionally, I, I believe in external reality just like anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, rationally, I can never prove that there's anything beyond my experiences. I can't know that you're not just sort of ha a hallucination within my experience or, or just a pure product of my imagination. Mm -hmm. I can't know that for sure, but in some ways that's not the relevant question. Mm -hmm. The relevant question is I believe certain things and I live according to them. Uh, because of the way my structure constrains what I can know. Mm -hmm. And I think the radical constructivists also give credit to the, to the idea that if there is a world beyond our constructions, it does place constraints on how, we, how, how it can trigger us. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if somebody splashes a glass of water in your face, it, it, your structure in some ways determines your response. But the water has some impact on how it triggers right. those processes. Well, one thing that I notice is different about the way you're speaking about constructivism and the way uh, a phenomenologist would work is that it seems like you're talking about people and worlds from an observer perspective. Mm -hmm. Like, people are these interior spaces and there's constructions outside, you know, and I'm using this gesture like that's over there, and I, this is what happens with people. And they're a system, and then there's things that impact those systems that causes change in that system. But that system can never really know what's outside of that system. It can never come into direct contact. Right. So I can look at you and I can say, well, you're a system of meaning, you know, and in some sense, I'm a stimulus that comes along and sort of sets off certain triggers in you, changes in you, and but, you but, respond. But the, the thing that, one of the mistakes is to assume that the thing that triggers determines the response. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. Right. So that when something from the external world perturbs my system right. and puts it into a state of disequilibrium, I my system is what restructures right. itself. Right. It's and dialectical. So, and right? so in the, sense right. the stimulus has something to do with how you're triggered. So my understand yeah, but it, it underdetermines my response. Right. So it may perturb me, it may disrupt the homeostasis of my system. Mm -hmm. But then my system sort of is what reorganizes. Right. And then how I respond is a product of my system, mm -hmm. not so much due to the actual stimulus. That is, the stimulus very much underdetermines, and, and the, the person is what dictates. So, so events occur, and the meanings I make of them, the ways that I organize and reorganize my understandings in response to them, is as important, or in many ways more important, than the thing that originally triggered me. Okay. Um, yeah, that makes sense. But what I wanted to emphasize, and I, I understand that, is first of all, I think that's very, that's actually a commonality, I think, between phenomenology right. and constructivism, where it's this dialectic, mm -hmm. right? This understanding that experiences is, is, is a dialogue between our right. own 
set of right. constructions or presuppositions yep. or embodied uh, intentions mm -hmm. and the world's uh, yeah. uh, the, 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 the transcendent world's uh, impact on that. Uh, and, and if you go to Husserl, he would say intentionality has two poles. That's what he calls noema and noesis, right? Mm -hmm. Noesis is, is the uh, act of consciousness, right. and the noema is the product of that mm -hmm. act. So the noema is the world I'm experiencing, and noesis is the act of consciousness. And, and so, you know, you're right now, as I'm talking to you, part of my noema, the product of consciousness, the intentional act is, you know, the, is the uh, how I'm, uh, in constructivist terms, how I'm construing, mm -hmm. you know, what, what you mean right now as we're having this conversation. That's, I think that that's a commonality. Where I think there's a difference is that, is the perspective, that you're talking about people in what I would call a third person perspective. Like I'm talking about other people in a way that you would observe them from the outside. Whereas phenomenology methodologically attempts to go from the, start from the in, uh, inside out. So well, why would I be, why would you be observing? I'm not sure why you're saying. The from the first person perspective. They're observing them from the outside. I don't, I don't get that. Because you're always observing, well, what you know is always from within your own experience. Right. Um, but I wouldn't see it necessarily as I'm observing you from the outside. And I'm, I'm, well, I'm saying sure. methodologically, I wonder how, do you, how does a constructivist go about investigating questions? Maybe is it, that would they help wouldn't, me. They wouldn't yeah. be necessarily methodologically committed to any one single way. There'd, there'd be multiple ways of inquiry. And depending on what my purposes were at any given time, I might do different things. OK. So I might use very traditional empirical methods, like mm -hmm. I did today in my presentation. Mm -hmm. I might do a traditional research study right. and say, you know, that, that if I collect data in an empirical way and do it using uh, traditional scientific experimental methodologies, that might be one way for me to understand. Well, but I, I also might try something fun. Well, what's the goal of that investigation? Of those it, it's always practical. Mm -hmm. That is, knowledge is a tool. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is always a way to accomplish desired ends. And so if I have certain goals in mind or certain things I want to accomplish, there are particular ways of going about um, conceptualizing things and understanding things and making sense out of things, uh, then that's fine. So, so constructivists are not methodologically driven. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they may at times be critical of ways in which traditional psychological science kind of worships its method mm -hmm. and say, well, there may be times when that method isn't as helpful or it doesn't get us where we want to go and at that point we're free to try something else but it's not methodologically driven it's not sort of committed to the idea that you have to do just phenomenology or you have to do traditional yeah quantitative experimental methods. Well I would say phenomenological philosophy, this is where phenomenological philosophy would say and then I'll come back to it. I think you're right that phenomenological psychology in a sense is a tool that you could use for mm -hmm. different purposes sometimes empirical yeah. methods in psychology are appropriate like you used today. Yeah. I really liked your study that you talked about today. You can do that in another interview. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, and I think that you can see phenomenological psychology in that way. It's a tool. It's a way of understanding yeah. psychological meanings. There's other ways of answering psychological questions. You know, I use mixed methods approaches. 